Eric Ten Hag's future at Manchester United is uncertain amid worrying season at Old Trafford, with the club potentially falling below the seventh place mark for the first time in the Premier League era. The Dutchman enjoyed a stunning first season at the club, guiding his side back to the Champions League by way of finished third place, finishing ending United's six-year wait for silverware. His second campaign, however, has been far from a success, with the season plagued by injuries, off-the-pitch drama and dysfunctional side on the pitch and now the dressing room un unrest leading to Sir Jim Ratcliffe have to step in and shut down the social media misconduct. I cannot help by feeling sorry for the guy with a pile of shit pouring down on him at the moment. United is falling adrift from the Champions League hopefuls and their only hope of any success this season is falling on the FA Cup with the semi-final waiting us this, this weekend. With the introduction of a new footballing hierarchy slated to commence in July 2024, featuring Omar de Berada, Dan Ashworth, the director of football, Jason Wilcox as technical director, the future is current manager Ten Hag under Ratcliffe's leadership remains uncertain beyond the upcoming summer season. However, we do have an exclusive update regarding his to be or not to be. The British billionaire has wasted no time initiating significant changes at executive level. With John Murta and Richard Arnold, the CEO, out of the door, he's been smacked in the face, falling to the floor. Can he pick himself up, Arten? Finishing strong at the moment, he's swimming alone in the deep ocean with the sharks circulating around him, ready to take a bite. But he will not go down so fast without a fight. Hopefully, we can win the FA Cup, baby. <laughs> the FA Cup, baby. You know what I'm talking about. But you know what? He's like the mad professor. Some fans calling for his head already. You know, they call him the mad professor, doing the same thing over and over again, picking up the wrong players week in and week out and expecting different results. But the results this season hasn't changed, cannot lie. The question is, is he aware of this? If so... Is he playing himself for the sack? Uh, as Amit reports claiming his old club, Ajax, won him back. Welcome to MUFC Realist TV. This is Mick Ruby, of course. And today's show, we have a jam-packed show. I'm joined in the studio with Bilal Yogi from Full Time Reds. We have a lot of things to discuss without any fuss, including the Manchester City's 115 charges trial date. Please do not forget to smash that like button, subscribe if you haven't done so yet, and get yourself ready to join the show. Are you ready? Let's go. And, uh, welcome to the stream of the day, first stream of the day, Bilal Yogi next to me, the gentleman to the right or to the left. I don't know. I'm, you know, what's the mirror reflection here? <laughs> how do you see yourself? Hang on, I got to turn around. Yeah, it's to the left. Yeah, 100%. Bilal, how are you doing today? Yeah, yeah. I'm good. Thank you, Mick. Thank you for having me on. Very appreciated. You're welcome, sir. You're welcome, sir. How are you feeling today to be a Manchester United fan? I always ask the question. Well, when I started the year as a Manchester United fan, I had hair and now I have no hair. <laughs> So you that like should tell you everything how I feel as a Manchester <laughs> United fan. Yeah, you're like bold as Ten Hag at the moment, and bold. Is... I am. Even even my eyebrows are going now. Oh my That's God. the only hair left. Can you imagine the pile of shit that this manager is going through? Like, and I feel sorry for him to be honest. Like, you know, as the opening statement, he is left alone totally. There's no Richard Arnold. There's no CEO. There's no director of football. It's just him, isolated slated by the media and some fans you know calling for his head and um, I, j I just feel sorry for him like you know we need to put this to bed and there's been numerous reports of throwing out there like you know regarding the Zerbi who's going to replace him Tuchel I mean the famous Gareth Southgate and today it was come out from the press as well into Twitter that the Zerbi is one of the candidates but it's more agent talk filler talk Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't yeah, feel look, great. Absolutely. But before I start, Mick, first I want to congratulate you on getting your column in the USA Today, uh, which starts, I think, quite soon, and you're going to be covering that. So congratulations yeah, to you, you on that. Um, I think, um, and, and secondly, congratulations on the exclusive you broke on your own website, which we're going to cover today, um, oh, where you okay. spoke to sources within. You know, yeah. I'm sure yeah, we're going yeah. to touch upon that as well. Just, yeah, just yeah. before we get into it, I think, Mick, um, we discussed this off air just before we came on. And um, yeah. I, like yourself, 
even though on my own channel, Full Time Reds, we've covered it a lot. You've covered it a lot. We've covered it as a collaboration a lot. Yeah. We do not want Ten Hag to get sacked, right? We want Ten Hag to be a success. But unfortunately, yeah. Ten Hag will get himself sacked. And yeah. that is the truth. And if you remember, Mick, me and you discussed this a while back. And I said, it, where my perception of Ten Hag changed was the home game against Tottenham, who had their fourth or third choice midfield and they played us off the park. And I went in my head, the injury excuse went out the window. And yeah. we've seen this now, even on um, the weekend and other games that you've covered as well. Really, we're only missing two players. We're only missing Sean Martinez. The rest is pretty much full and runs in and mm -hmm. out. But it's mm -hmm. an, and everyone's missing players, right? It's a pretty much full fit squad. And yes. we've got worse and we've not got better. We've regressed, 100%. Uh, yeah, we've regressed. And, um, you know, uh, it's it, it, when I was looking at your article on your own website today uh, with the exclusive that you have on there, I was looking at oh, it. Oh, you mean this one? Hang on a second. This yeah, one, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, and I've got some questions around that, mate, that I am going to ask you on this. Um, should we go into that straight away, or do you want to cover something else no, first? No, no, continue, continue, continue. Yeah, yeah. So, mate, so I, I had a look at this article, and I there were some great points on there, and your source was kind of validated on what I was thinking on this. Um, what? How, how does the restructuring of Manchester United's football operation under Jim Radcliffe impact Ten Hag and his current situation, in your opinion? Well, it does and it doesn't. Um, because even if you get in the current footballing structure operations that start in July 2024, and that's what it's been said, it will take them approximately one year to get warm into their roles in the clothes, right? And this is a rebuild which will take you on know, a roadmap of approximately two to three years to fully establish. I mean, the, the overall vision is to start from top to the bottom, right? So at the moment, as I said, like, you know, Ten Hag is currently swimming alone and the closest to get in is uh, Wilcox. And Wilcox will take over as an interim sporting director until Dan Ashworth comes in, together work with the Hardgreaves as well in terms of the negotiations. So that's why they don't see uh, any reason to rip up the trees at the moment. You know what I mean? We, we talked about the, I mean, I don't want to talk about the style of play. We haven't had a style of play for 11 years, to be honest, right? So we, we talked about the injuries until we blew in the face. Yeah. But the, the point is, is the mad professor, right? What they are calling him because he keeps being stubborn. He doesn't listen. He doesn't see, like keeps playing players that are not deserving to get the chance on the pitch. And when you do that, you expect different results. So the perception within Ineos, at least, is to say, well, we will stick with Ten Hag until now. There is no other manager. They appreciate the um, the level of candidates the media has presented, but they are not the ones that they are interested. They feel it's better to stick with Ten Hag for one year that is left on his contract instead of paying out £10 million for him, plus his entourage, give him a backing in the summer, meaning clearing out the players that don't deserve to be there and which is going to be the hardest job for them in the summer. So it's going to be a busy summer in terms of the outs. In terms of the ins, yeah, you are looking at the recruitment strategy of potentially going for the 26-year-olds and younger, you know, because they're building a squad for the future. Now, in this interim, how is this going to impact Ten Hag? It's a good question because one thing that Ten Hag is very good at, which has been recognized, is giving youth development a chance if you think about it if you stop for a while you know looking at the whole conundrum you understand that he has given Kobe Maino a chance developed him Ganacho he brought in a young Hoyland you give Willy Kwambala a chance and now you've seen today the Shea Lacey signed his first contract so there is what they are focusing on the, the, the academy which they've been building for five years, which are starting to bear fruit. And they believe that Ten Hag is the right manager to do so. How this will impact? I don't think it will impact because they believe in the summer they will have the clear out and they will um, approximately recruit, recruit five to four players. Um, it means that you, you, you're introducing youth and you're adding on more experience as well from 
domestic and international. So I hope that answers your your question. Let, so the, let me the rest let, of Southgate and everything else is just paper talk. Let me play a bit of a devil's advocate here for your viewers, especially right. Um, let's let's play like this then. Let's say they start the season with Ten Hag, right? Mm-hmm. They yeah. then get to December, November, December is usually when the wheels come off on Manchester United. As per usual. And, <laughs> right? So then are they going to write... Then they're in a situation where they have to um, try finding a manager because maybe a manager they wanted is not on the market. Yep. They're in between. And historically, when you change a manager halfway through the season, I was looking at the comments there. Somebody yep. mentioned Chelsea. United have done this multiple times. But Oli, I think um, it hasn't worked. Then are they going to write next season off? Then uh, as, as no, a, because it's, it's, no, because it, I, I've been told by a very credible source as well that you know even if they give him all the backing in the summer, if it goes, excuse my language, tits up, they already have aligned the preferred candidate. You know, in their mind, they have they're not going to go to the market now because it's an unprecedented season where you have a lot of clubs looking for new manager and they feel that we don't want to enter that competition. They're looking more beyond when you have already established that foundation, you know what style of play you want to play and you know what kind of manager can elevate you to the next level. If Ten Hag is successful, they will sit down and discuss again. But if it goes tits up, they already have aligned replacement in place and there are Managers, which been mentioned, that are available twenty twenty five in summer. You know, just looking at that, just looking at that, what 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 factors will influence the decision to keep him? In your opinion, for example, you've mentioned the youth as one that he brings in through youth. Do mm-hmm. you think? But bar that, Mick, um, since this season. I don't see what else they can look at and say, you know, um, he's gonna, he's he. There's something there that can um, he can do. So, it, there's no other credit in the bank, in my opinion, unless no. you see something else. No, but you can see this is as, as the last credit of the bank. You know, um, of course, qualifying deep into you know Europe is a vital part. Like you know. European League is kind of dwindling away at the moment, the Champions League, but we still have a chance to get into whatever some people want, don't want to like to hear this Conference League or Europa League. Um, but the trajectory is to look at two year, three year plan to win as per Sir Jim Ratcliffe's uh, you know, manifesto and statement, because that's what they want to do. There's no, there, there's no reason why they've gone and appointed the best in class people. So hence they have the best in class manager in place as well. And currently they feel that they have the right manager in place, but as you said, the credit is running out. So you this you can consider it as a final trial period. You know what I mean? Um, you have one year left on your contract, prove it to yourself. If we give you the right backing over the summer and see what, how you can perform. So if he does perform, then they are willing to sit down to discuss another contract. But a lot of things has to change. And not only Ten Hag has a big problem on his head, but also Sir Jim Ratcliffe and Ineos or Trollis Limited, considering the outs with Donny van de Beek coming back and stuff like that. So they, they have a massive problem on their head. You know, um, I think, in my opinion, they should either give him an, a new contract or remove him. Because going into a season, Mick, where he's in his final year and you get to December and you're still above fourth, fifth, there's too much uncertainty trying to sign players under him will be difficult because there's uncertainty um, either you back him or you suck him, it's, there's no other way in my opinion um, you mentioned a lot of high profile managers who 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 do you if this was to happen who do you yeah. like the look of it's not what I like, it's what the club like in certain ways um, in, that's all I can say. Um, in my opinion what I've been told and what I heard is they are you know, highly regarded on the list is Javier Alonso. That is also linked to Real Madrid, but he's available next year in the summer 2025 from Bayern, Leverkusen. And believe it or not, you might call me mad, but Pep Guardiola is also available in 2025 and the links with Omar Barada and Pep, uh, it's uh, inseparable. 
you know, he he's out of contract as well. So there might be a, somebody they're looking at on the list as well. But also Real Madrid's, uh, you know, Carlo Ancelotti is also considered to be the best in class there as well. And, you know, they, they, they both uh, have been like, you know, proven to be winners and, and can do things and can develop youth. And But another name that they don't want to go away that, you know, that is kind of linked with, um, you know, Van Blanc, you know, it's Jean-Claude, uh, Jean-Claude Blanc, it's uh, Zinedine Zidane, but it's a hard sell with Zidane. You know, he's already retired. He's done his thing. And uh, Zidane, partic- Zidane, now Zidane particularly don't like to play youth. You know, he, Zidane is t- typically a player that comes in with ready-made squad and win with a red-made squad. So that is just like on the list. But um, yeah, I mean, me personally, if I if I have to choose between them, me personally, I would go for Javi Alonso, hundred percent. How about you? I think if they were to remove him, there's only one man for the job, and that man is Unai Emery at Aston Villa. He is yes. proven. He is the man. He is undoubtedly a ex- yeah. exceptional coach. Um, he did well. You know, he with the reason and the reason I am mentioning him and I mention him on Twitter is because he would work very well in this structure of a coach, and he is tactically exceptional in my opinion. Um, so I would look at somebody like him, um, in my opinion. Mick, just coming on to um, Ten Hag, where do you think he's going wrong tactically? You know, we, we covered this so many times and I'm just tired of the whole in-out and tactically. And it is, f- first and foremost, the zonal marking that has to go on corners. You know, uh, there's no spatial awareness in the midfield as well. The the gap, the stretch between the midfield attack and the defense is far too big, right? So that is tactical. And this is something that he doesn't refuse to change. You know, we are conceding far too many goals and that is due to that big stretch in the midfield, right? We have players that don't want to track back. You have a system that is demanding like in a high intensity press high up on the pitch, but we have players that don't press and don't don't track back. We have wingers, without mentioning any names, that get picked over others that is complacent and don't want to do the job, which leads that the defense is conceding way too many goals, right? Because you don't get any help and we don't have even, you know, score a lot of goals because we don't even have service towards the central striker so that's tactically everything has gone wrong this window first season was working but since he implemented this new tactical change in this season i don't think the players understand it or players haven't bought into it you can put in consideration all the injuries and everything that's been piling on but as a manager you have to navigate around the injuries you've seen how eddie howe has done it you know by the way, Newcastle has had equal much as injuries we have. I think we had about 60 different types of injuries to our squad and different personnel in the centre-back. But if you have all these issues, um, as the mad professor, what some people call him, right? Um, definition of insanity is to do what, Bilal? Yeah. To do the same thing over and over again and expect insanity, different results. Yeah, it's a sign of yeah. insanity. So why don't you tweak it? Like it's been, at the end of the day, like, you know, chaos football, right? And... Um, and this is what a lot of fans are feeling that this is not good enough, right? You know, our team only knows one style and that's counter-attacking football. And why? Because this is the way they're being coached, right? So it comes down to coaching as well. Like, you know, what are you doing in training? Can't you see, go back after each game to say, hey, Bruno, you didn't track back here. Like, sit down here. Casemiro, why didn't you track back here? If you sit on Monday morning, watch the videos and pinpoint the errors and work on it. But it seems like they don't do it. Or it it might be also that fatigue has kicked in also with the coaching staff as well. That say, you know what? I fell flat on my face. I have no idea anymore what I'm doing. There's a lot of lot of questions. What 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 do you think? I think I think I watched Unai Emery play a high line at Arsenal in that second half. Oh yeah, this was brilliant. And Arsenal couldn't get out there half really. And if Ten Hag, which I am pretty sure is showing the players the the mistakes and they keep doing them. Why does he keep picking them then? Exactly. You know, you could have played a midfield of Ericsson, Mount and Amrabat yeah. against um, Bournemouth. You can do, you know, why play Casemiro? Why play Rashford? 
Mm. Why play players that don't mm. keep making the mistakes? Exactly. You know, so he's he. Hence, why at the start of the show I said he will sack himself. Exactly, which leads into the the uh, the next segment as well. Anyway, thank you people for tuning in. We can see you in the VR room as well. Big up to you. I'm gonna switch the stage so you can see each other in this in the chat as well. Um, listen, at the end of the day, like you know, you got a point there, like you know, because there was. After the Bournemouth game, there was some kicking off, um, you know, within the Anthony, you know, Ganacho, all that stuff. And rightfully so, because they're questioning, and I've been talking about this because I feel, Bilal, that the most important thing in the summer is to get rid of the players that don't have the mentality that are getting paid way too much because they're setting an example as a role models for the youngsters, right? If you're now all of a sudden going to bring in Shea Lacey to the first team, you know, who, Harry Amas and all the stuff, they will look up to the senior players. So this is exactly what happened. So Rashford, as a scapegoat, arguably with the Belfast Bebe incidents and stuff like that, has got away with murder. Now, you have Anthony looking at, hang on a second, I'm putting in week in and week out. I do training, I put in a shift, I work hard and I don't get picked. And you pick Rashford that doesn't really care. Or Ganacho that was out train out for training the whole week and trained on Friday and got picked. Well, I've been busting my gut, doing performance, you know, doing well against Liverpool, scoring goals, and I still don't get picked. The same with Ahmad, right? So that's questionable. And arguably to so why they've been kicking up a fuss. So yeah, imagine I'm, I'm... imagine yourself like you go to work and you 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 know you're part of a project and you do everything but you still don't get picked to be the project leader. Instead, your manager picks the person that done the less to be the leader. What you gonna think? What you gonna react below? Hence, why I'm saying he will get himself sacked unless he makes these changes quickly. Could he imagine if they lose to Coventry on Sunday? Oh yeah, yeah. 100%. Anyway, I'm going to go to the chat for a second. Darren Hardling is here. He'll get his 10 million and the job back at Ajax. And this is perfectly what we're going to talk about next as well. Uh, Michael Hill. Big up, Michael Hill. Welcome to the show as well. Playing for his sack sounds like playing for his ball back. <laughs> I had feeling he gave up a while ago. What do you reckon about that? Did he give up a while you know, back ago? Michael's got a very valid point. I, I don't understand one thing, um, and I and I remember under Oli, I was I, I had a similar thought, and when Oli looked out of his depth, and I felt Ten Hag looked out of his depth on Saturday, especially after the game. I don't understand why these managers just don't resign, and they wait for a sack. Is if it's that bad, just resign. You'll keep your credibility. You'll actually get more credibility by doing that well, and, and walking away. It's like Ollie said, oh, I knew after the Watford game I was over. Then just walk away. It's not like that. Walk away. Like, you know, take it for somebody who's been in the intermediate agency market for eight, um, almost eight years. It's just you you, you take it. Managers do hate, have agents as well. And agents advise managers not to do it because it's money in the bank. So what, what you try to do is to, is to get yourself sex so you get out pay these severance but if you do do resign you miss out on the severance you know what i mean the package payout then then sit down with the club and say guys look this isn't working let's mutually agree to end it right rather than waiting for the club to make a decision you look unhappy uh, Mourinho did this and he went into a season knowing he was going to get sacked but yeah he, he got sacked till like november why not sit down and say guys look i've tried my best it's not working I, I think we should go in a different direction. You owe me 10 million. Let's agree on seven and call it a day. And it's pretty straightforward. It is straightforward. But unfortunately, it doesn't happen like that. You know, Martial could have walked away in the summer. His Mick, agent advised him not to do. His agent advised him to take a sickie. You know, they released a statement that he had a groin surgery, but in fact, it was hips deductors. And what's it going to be? Hips don't lie. At the end of the day, it's what the manager decides to do you under the contract legally you have the right to just call in a sickie and still get paid right you don't walk away Mick, from money i remember and some fans like me might be as old as me will remember maximum respect should be given to someone like kevin keegan who lost to germany in the final game at wembley and quit in the postmaster interview said mm -hmm. i've taken it as far as i can i can't do this and he quit 
maximum respect to him. I do not understand why managers just don't f- sit down with the club. Right, guys, this isn't working. You can tell. I can tell. Yeah. Um, you you want to get I mean, rid of me. Then. I don't think it's working. I'm owed 10 million. Let's call it seven. Let's call it a day. Why drag the fans through weeks and weeks of this shit is beyond me. Yeah. But, you know, agents have more power than you think nowadays in terms of footballing matches and how they run clubs and they have way too much influence. You know, what Klopp did was honorable thing. He came up to say, like, I cannot do this anymore. If I cannot be 100% on top, what Absolutely. good am I to the team and to the club? He did the honorable thing, which I salute. Although I don't like Liverpool, I dis- I like what Klopp is doing. He's a great manager, but just can't stand the bastard. You know what I mean? But what he did was absolutely the right thing to do, right? If you're not mentally prepared, you're drained, you're, you're emotionally tired, you know, just call it the quits. Just put your hand up and walk away. Let's just look at it, right? The people that appointed Ten Hag are not at the club anymore, right? Number no, one. Number two, the results are not going in his favour. Number three is his... If the, regardless of the results, his playing style is going backwards, right? At that point in his head, he must thinking, shit, this is the most I can do. It doesn't look like um, uh, this is going to work. And, you know, another thing, I said this on my own show, he should have actually quit last summer. Because oh. if you look at history, history tells you when a new ownership comes in, they bring their own manager in. And he was on a high... He would have walked out saying, look, I got United to third. I won the cup in the middle of a takeover. I did not sign up for this. Yeah, no. Listen, at the I end of the day, Mourinho, Mourinho said the same thing. Smart. Yeah, That would at have the been really smart of him and he would have held his uh, reputation yeah, as well. True. But at the end of the day, if you if you track back, you, you remember Mourinho said the same thing and everyone was wondering, what the hell are you smoking, Mourinho? When he said, like, you know, in 2017 season, when you say finishing second and winning Europa League was the biggest achievement with this team and he's rightfully so because Curl is like you know it comes here as well we have learned nothing from sacking Eric Ten Hag and I don't want to see a second manager because I want to see for the first time in the club's history since Eric Ten Hag since uh, Sir Alex Ferguson left that we actually seeing through a three-year tenure with the manager right but it also comes down to what you said there have you reached your limit to what the squad and players <laughs> are about you know, have you milked the max out of them? And if so, if you have all these injuries, why don't you rotate and give, you know, address the situation? Why are you playing players dysfunctional that are not the natural positions? These are valid questions you got to ask. You know, I'm I'm tired of this in and out debate. I'm I'm not. I'm here for the footballing reasons. I'm here for the club. And I'm here for Manchester United because this is the club that I love. You know, I just don't, for the love of God understand why we're even having this debate because it's the hamster wheel over and over again, right? So I'd agree with Curtis that if we do sack another manager, we haven't learned anything as of yet. Well, we have. I, believe- no, no, no. I disagree with that. We have learned something. We have learned not to give the manager that much power in transfers, in CESO, and in a proper structure, we get a coach in that's told how the, a club should play and how he should adapt to that. And these are the players that are given to you. We can't keep buying manager players for managers. Mm. Sorry, chat. If we, I mean, we, it's so much things to digest, you know. If I forget to shout you out, like, you know, we need to start from the ground level. Squad is crap, backroom is crap, upstairs crap. And that is Compass Murph, exactly what's going on at the moment. So far, it's been a lot of PR. We cannot lie, right? We haven't seen any concrete evidence more than we heard these appointments are going to start in the summer. So we are entering the uncharted waters at the moment. Would you agree? Mick, Mick, you but but but, but 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 still, what happened to the glazes out? Right? Have we completely forgotten who is in the background? You know, that completely stopped. So just keep in mind who is still calling the shots while Eric Ten Hag is swimming there, getting almost eaten by the media. He has no protection. There's no CEO. There's no sporting director. You have Darren Fletcher that's laying out the cones. And by the way, the club is talking to keep Darren Fletcher, but to give him the correct title, cone layer. (laughs) Mick, you've worked in HR. I run businesses. And let's let's not be as black and white as you telling me that right now Dan Ashworth is not taking calls 
from Dave Brailsford asking opinions, <clears throat> looking at players on WhatsApp, on a secret burner phone that nobody has or nobody knows. You know, Normal. this happens all the time. Normal. This rubbish of like, you know, fucking Dan Ashworth. Mate, Dan Ashworth is officially, not unofficially, he's working in the background, scouting players. He, These guys are having yep. calls. I would not be surprised if he's been to Monaco a couple of you times. Know, you know, uh, to answer the question, <clears throat> yes, sure. Um, listen, when you are put on a garden leave, you you know, the company takes away all your uh, proprietary information because it belongs like the computer, the info. But you surely you have a backup, right? It's your scout and network book. You'll have you a have. backup. You'll have lists. Yeah, you'll have. Let's, and, let's just look at it from a professional aspect, right? Newcastle have taken him off the systems, but he is still very well connected. He could be having chats with agents yeah. he knows very well. He could be speaking to people he knows very well. You know, um, and that's where City was smart. City said, all right, this guy's going. Let's just thrash out the deal. Six months gardening leave. He can start in the summer. You're happy, we're happy. We need to deal with each other every other week. Let's just keep it positive. So this this aspect that he's on gardening leave and he's not doing anything. Yeah, he, no, that's they're all that's, working technically, in my that's opinion. That's just been that's just been amplified by by the media, uh, to be honest, because behind the scenes is totally different ball game. You know what I mean? Um just to it's start like when there. Mick, it's like Mick, it's like when they just, say a player never gets topped up. What yeah, they do. <laughs> they do. Constantly. That's why you're an agent. Um, listen, at the end of the day, if if we stick to that, um, what's going on in the background, of course, you have... Yeah. Dan Ashwood has already resigned, you know, factories, like, you know, we've been saying this, like 10 million to Newcastle, five to his own pocket because, you know to compensate the garden leave or the determination, right? Right now, when you are on garden leave, you basically terminate your contract, but you're servicing your, um, how do I say, notice period. And if you leave earlier, you miss that compensation, right? Newcastle have no benefits from stopping him to go anywhere, right? Newcastle by themselves are using headhunters like ourselves to get their target in place before summer as well their footballing director so it's it's nothing to do it's more media talking the reason why you're not seeing anything because because they are keeping it very tight lid right there's no point of announcing anything until this season is over and you will see that happening right but the deal is done in principle already he's already resigned so the rest is just you know you know what i'm talking about the um yeah it's also the the, the proof is in the pudding Murto resigned last week yeah, and, and I'm getting to that because heads will roll, like, you know, uh, and it's part of the article that I wrote because it's a total re, um, revamp what's going to be happening. So you start from the top. Uh, everyone that's been appointed under Ed Woodward is going, 100%. And that is including, you know, Murta will be going. Um, Fletcher might be restructured because they gave him a wrong title, technical director. He was, he's been spotting laying cones in training, so he's not a technical director. And the minute they say we're going to appoint, you know, Wilcox, that means that he's out of the door. The minute they say we're going to appoint Dan Ashwood, Murta is out of the door. The next, what you got to look out for is the CEO, which is the chief operating officer. I'm not going to mention names because of YouTube, but you know who she is. Uh, Colette Roche, right? And Patrick Stewart, the CFO as well. So, First and foremost, you got to start from the top on the leadership because the leadership are the ones that stills the vision all the way from the top down to the dressing room, right? It's it's got to be equal cultural values that you instill. The vision needs to be in place, and then you you trickle it down all the way to the management and all down to the you know even for the people that changes the boots and washing the 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 jerseys every day. So it's going to be something equal, and that's going to take time. It's going to take two to three years, right? So that's why I'm said like you know. It's going to take at least one year for this new establishment to come in place and, you know, to put the vision in place, the the structure, the organizational structure in place. So therefore, it doesn't really make sense what Ineos is saying right now that we're going to replace Ten Hag because that's just going to create another problem. You get my point? Yeah, I do. I do. But I think Ineos don't want to sack him, but he's not helping himself because if me and you can see these problems... Then they can see these problems. And I was watching Peter Schmeichel on Talk Sport, I think it was, who was sat next to Jim Radcliffe in the Chelsea game. And he was saying the problems we can see, he can see, and he's not very happy. So that yeah. tells you everything. 
Yeah. Listen, I will get to the chat later on, but this transitions over to the next story, which is something that I had a finger on the pulse because I, I've been saying this, like, and I have been like, what are you doing, right? I First and foremost, I would love him to succeed, like, you know, but as we said, what we've been witnessing has been a conundrum of a lot of things combined together in takeovers, in, in, in dysfunctional team, in dressing room, the the player power, you've seen that they have started to control the leaks, but the leaks are still out there. The social media still exist. But the tweet that came out from was a Ganacho with the likes. Bear in mind yeah. that players do have the social media team. It might not be him. It might be his social media team. If it was the social media team, I would sack them ASAP. Because agents nowadays they handle the 360 meaning the 360 the whole social media campaign the banking the financing they just want to even counseling whenever it's needed because all they want to do is to play to focus on the football and that's what they're there for so if somebody's pressed that and deleted it that means there must be the social media team and that's been nipped in the bud now it came out today what are you know the pr that Ratcliffe steps in all of a sudden and be the savior of the day, shutting it down. They already sacked the social media director, by the way, from Manchester United. So that is a step towards direction. That was the first one out of the door, you know. Um, mate, but, you know, at the end of the day, we've been saying this with dubious mind to say, what are you doing? Why are you doing the same thing over and over again? Are you playing yourself for the sack, right? It's not a secret that Ajax is doing very poorly. You know, ever since Ten Hag left and took um, Mitchell van der Haag, they've been bad. You, They lost Overmars, they lost van der Sar, and ever since that trio went, it's been dire, you know. They've been shit. And apparently now, as what we've been saying, the plan B is on, on the list of Ajax wanted managers to come back. And this is not from me. This comes from, you know, Sports Witness. Right. Um, I'm just going to be careful. So I quote this correct, you know, soccer news via sport and witness. Correct. Dutch football expert Mike Vert Vey has revealed that Ten Hags has emerged as a potential candidate for Ajax job this summer. So if you are like Ten Hag at the moment, experienced, you have all this pylon on you, been left alone swimming. Of course, you're going to be deflated. Put yourself in a human emotion situation, in a work situation. How much shit can you take, right? Maybe you realize, shit, this is going to be too much for me. I remember an interview to say, like, you know, we need to be on the same page. And, and Manchester United is the biggest club in the world. I cannot do it by myself, right? But still, is this his ticket out potentially to play yourself out of the sack? Because you know that Ajax wants both you and Mitchell back. What's your thoughts? Because this is this been think, a report thing. Yeah, I think I've seen the report. I've seen the report, and I don't think he'll go back to Ajax. In my honest opinion, I can see him going Dortmund if he was to leave. I think regarding him, he's reached his limit, and what you're seeing now is his limit. Um, hence why he's running out of ideas. I don't see how he can take this team forward. Wait. Tactically, he's reached his limit. In, in what way when you say tactically? I mean, forget about style of play. That goes out the window, yeah. right? We're not going to But tactically... He have the answers on how like, to, to take the I team think, forward. I think he has the answer, but he doesn't have the right personnel for the for, for his tactics, right? I, no, I he think doesn't that, make, because he's not playing the players he's bought either. Well, then you shot yourself in the foot. Like, you know, That's particularly point. with Anthony. Ericsson, right? Ericsson doesn't play. Amrabat doesn't play. And both of them would give... Uh, Ericsson was exceptional for his last season. Amrabat's not played since the City game. Amrabat will give you more pop drive than Casemiro, right? So so there are two players that he signed. Anthony doesn't play. Hmm. He should be playing over Rashford. You can switch... But what, is that, and, what is that telling you, Bilal? Are you just playing survival football for your own job? Like, the typical mistakes, what each and every manager has done that's been getting the sack is to trust in the wrong players and they're still here right each and single manager a common nominator including jose Mourinho, was playing scott mctominay rashford shaw 
just a few to mention, they're still at the club. What happens at the end of the season is that manager trap. They do the same mistake what other managers done, and he's currently falling into the same trap, right? Well, you have the proof that's been in the pudding and eaten. Why are you doing the same mistake? This is valid questions, right? From a footballing perspective and fan perspective, 100%, right? You know. So what is the limit? So bear with me. My point is I rather see certain players go out before the manager go, go out. I'm willing to, to give it another year, according to what their sources and the reports are saying, to see what you can do in terms of, you know, get rid of those players that, that doesn't understand you, or doesn't fit your system because they are players from all the managers. We're talking about counter-attacking football system, right? The way I want to play football is high press, high possession, playing high line. That's why I brought in uh, Unana, right? But at the moment, I'm not picking this because now I'm playing survivor football, so I just want to win points. But when this is not working, then you shot yourself in the foot. And I agree with you that you say that there is no solution. But if we look forward further than your nose here, look at the summer, look at the next season, just envision what can happen. And this is the way Ineos are seeing it. They're seeing, okay, we, are, we understand everything. We might not get Champions League, but at the moment, if we do get rid of this Deadwoods, right? The biggest issue here and the challenge for, for them will be the outs. And we complement with few new players and we introduce some Starlets Academies. Let us see how you will cook, right? That might work in your system, but you got to fix up that midfield. And one thing that you need to address, Bilal, is the center defender midfielder. Because Casemiro legs is gone, totally gone. It hurts me to say it's gone. You cannot play Kobe Maino, a 20-year-old, to burn him down to the ground. But He's you've not got Amrabat, CDM. Mick. He's not even playing Amrabat. And why? These are That's questions that point. I don't have the answer to, Bilal, which I also the wonder. Thing is the thing is, Mick, if you watch the Rude Hullet clip that went viral when he asked him at Ajax about not having a midfielder that sits in, um, I think the style, and I said this on your show a couple of weeks ago, what you're seeing now is his actual style yeah. of gun-ho. This is his actual style. Was it cool it? Yeah, it was, it was at Ajax. Cool it. He had a, um, it was a televised show when Ten Hag Correct. says, forget about the midfield. And Hullet was like, what? And I was like, I remember this because for me, um, who played the game, for me, a game of football is won and lost in the midfield. I always say that. If you don't have an engine, which is the midfield, what's the point? If you only have the back wheel and front wheel, you might as well just line up five in the back and five in the front and just leave the gap. You have to close the gap, right? Was that Which yes. one was it? Was that Ruud Hullet? Because I've been looking yeah, for Rude that. Hullet. Clip. It was Ruud Hullet. It was the Ruud Hullet clip. And the thing is, you can get away with that in Ajax because the league is not as good. And when you've got the best players in the league, you can be a bit expansive and try these things. In England, as you've seen, the bottom team can turn you over and technically outplay you. We're seeing that, right? Hence why you know he's not showing adaptable change. And why I'm saying he's at his maximum, he doesn't know another way. Because you would have seen it by now. Maybe he can't right. play three at the back. He can't play three four yeah. three like Solskjaer because he doesn't know how. And he always plays one system in well, a lower league. True, you can get away with that. You, I mean, fair criticism to say, like you know, guys, if you're watching and in retrospect, there's no way we're slagging anything. We're just talking football and we see the problems on the pitch. And this is what we're discussing. Even if you Ten Hag in out, like we're talking about Manchester United, we're talking about current football, right? At, and you got a point there because his in-game management has been f dire, to be honest. And the reaction needs to come quicker. If you take the Bournemouth game in the first half, if you see it's not working, that, you know, he's been <laughs> over flooded in the midfield way too many times, even going back to the Wolves game, away game, right? Even if we won that game when Ganacha scored 4-3, we were overrun where you saw Matias Nunes just cutting through our midfield like it was open field day. You know what I mean? Open house day. So if you see that, if you take, just take this season and take that and you are conceding way too many shots, way too many goals, this doesn't make sense, right? But Mick, that is his style of play. 
Yeah, but in that case, if that is his style of play, then you need to recruit athletics, right? Athletes that can run up and down like Duracell bunnies, but unfortunately, we don't have it. And unfortunately, that is kind of the reason why you're seeing far too many muscle injuries. It's interconnected. There's, there's somebody in the comments that said he did it away at Madrid. Solskjaer did it away at PSG. Did he? A one-off game is different to yep. a regular a, a team that's consistently performing. And if you look at Pep Guardiola, in his first season, when he came to England, he said, I did not know what the second ball was. And he goes, once I figured out we have to win the second ball, I figured out how to play the league. Yeah. And look at how he changed profile of players where using Fernandinho. His whole profile of player from Bayern to Barca to City totally yeah. changed according to the league. But you got to adapt in certain situations, certain games. This is Premier League. This is the Fast and Furious, right? The best league in the world, but also the most um, toxin on, on your body, right? Because it's it's constantly rock and roll. Anyone can beat anyone in this team. These levels have improved. Even if you go away to Bournemouth, they can still beat you, right? But Jarvis is saying we play more of a 4-3-3 this season compared to clear 4-2-3-1 last season. But still, you got to be adept. Sometimes you got to play three in the back, play five in the middle. You know what I mean? Depending on what and, opponent and, you're playing. If we right? take Jarvis... If, if we take listen, Jarvis's listen, just, just let me land. Let me land. If you know that midfield is your problem, why don't you play three in the back and five in the middle just to shut that down the midfield and just do a mid-block, right? Mid-press block. Like what Bournemouth did against us, what Arniola did to us. There's levels of how you can change in-game management and, and, and tactics, which is something that we haven't seen. So we've been stuck with the same system or same strategy to say we, we, we doesn't change. The only thing that we saw different was against the Liverpool when we were 4-3 in the FA Cup when we qualified. He threw the chicken kitchen sink right in and just go gung-ho, start playing like, you know, uh, Maguire on top played like Anthony as a left back. It was just weird, right? And Bruno Fernandes. And that was him being a desperate just to win the points. And because he knows if he doesn't make FA Cup, this is his fine, final chance. He's toast, right? And now we're in, in semifinals. But it comes down to you got to be adaptable in certain moments. And we haven't seen it as fans. You know, my eyes see football in my way. You see football in your ways, Jarvis in his way. And opinions are like opinions, right? Yeah, but okay, then let's just check some of these comments, right? If you're going to play in, in the Premier League, you have to adapt and keep the ball. Otherwise, you'll keep getting turned over, right? T like yep. Bournemouth will turn you over. Brentford will turn you over. They'll all 100%. turn you over, right? So then why not play Mount, who can keep recycling the ball? Rather than Bruno, who keeps going along with the ball and try getting a, creating a chance on every ball. These are the issues that you're going to keep facing. Hence why I'm saying constructively, I feel he's reached his limit and he doesn't have another way of figuring this out because we would have seen it by now where try a new midfield, try yeah. two, four, four, two, right? Three, five, two, three, four, yeah. three. Right, yeah. and that's where. Why yeah, but I'm our formation is more five zero five in a certain ways. So even even entering in the final third, we have no idea what we're doing. There's no cohesion, no understanding. Right? If you notice, this like hot potato. Um, instead of just passing the ball around, having more possession, we are just so quick and losing the ball quickly. Right? So that has been frustrating. Right? Even when we enter the final third, we don't do cutback passes anymore. We don't distribute the ball to the wing, and wings don't cross. Rashford doesn't play like a teammate. He just, just like an Xbox setting, you know, you press R two and you dig your head down in the sand like an ostrich, right, hoping for the best, right. And instead of passing, you're shooting, and you lose if the you, ball, right. If you want to see a winger play. Watch Newcastle versus Spurs this Saturday that has gone by. Yeah. And watch Anthony Gordon play. Yeah, and that, that was will show proper. you how a winger should be playing with 100%. and without the ball. And that's 100%. all you need to know. 100%. So I agree what Kat is saying here. When the plan isn't working, doesn't seem to have a plan B. Or is it what we're saying? Like, are you doing this speculative, what the reports are saying, that Ajax wants you back, you and Mitchell? Are you doing this deliberately? Because at the end of the day, like you don't want to sort of resign yourself because you're losing out 10 million. 10 million, man, if I had 10 million pounds, woohoo, right? It's, yeah, it sounds it's like a fantasy figure. 
Mate? It's the damage he's doing to his reputation, though, Mick. It does. It does. It's it the does. The damage does. he's doing to his reputation is worth yeah. m- is worth more than the ten million. But instead of doing like um, Klopp did, like VD VD Vici, like you know, I come and saw and conquered, right, and just do the right thing. I come, I tried, it didn't work. Later, it's like, <laughs> yeah. Unless but, you know what what I've been told as well that you are you are there for the for the next foreseeable year. On a sort yeah, of probation look, To me, he doesn't play. Like, his team's not playing. He's not setting them up. Like, right, guys, we're going to get forget this season. This is the formation. You're my player. If Ka- everyone knows Casemiro's going, why is he playing him then? If he's here for the next year, if no, Ten Hag is here for the next why is he it's, not playing the players that he believes in long term? It's a goddamn mystery for me too. As a fan, it is. Because you see, you look at the bench, you say, why you... I mean, let's 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 take Bournemouth game. Why did you go with Rashford that just walks into the team, and Anthony, not even injured, been reported that he had uh, kicked up a fuss, asking the manager, "Hey, I'm training every day. I scored against Liverpool. Rashford gets a free pass. He doesn't do jack shit on the on the. Tra- he doesn't track back. Doesn't look interested. It looks like he already checked out, ready for a preseason at PSG." Just a speculation, you know what I mean? And other places as well, like, you know, Sabda Ganacho that he's been running to the ground and Kobe Maino. Protect, he's protecting certain players, right? But it, it comes down, you bought Anthony for 100 million. You are the one that bought Han- Anthony. You wanted him. Why are you not playing him all of a sudden, right? You, you understand it's, the problem? It's, it's, I think he feels none of the players can do what he wants in this league. And he is just playing players that he feels give give him something. You know, we, we're on about players that we can't get rid of. We should, act, and I want to mention this, there's not enough respect put on the name of Harry Maguire, who's been exceptional since he's been there. Okay. He, he's come in against Liverpool, every team. The guy's a beast in the air. Right. Even on the floor, yeah, he has his limitations. He might give the ball away. But he has been exceptional. And my point is, is that we were going on about toxic players. We need to get rid of players. Some of the players he tried to get rid of are the ones that are keeping him in the job. Yes, but the, the, the same players that he's trusting will also get him the sack. And that's yeah, the problem. Yeah, 100%. And that's, that's, that's going deluding to what I said before. Same managers trusted the same players. And where are the managers now? The players are still here. And that's the point. Listen, at the end of the day, big up VR room. Thank you. Sorry, we've been stuck in this debate. Um, Phil Jones reckon. Oh, Phil Jones. Phil, <laughs> we have famous Phil Jones in the house saying that Rashford is an out and out lazy bastard. Never passes. Never passes the ball. Get rid of him. You know what? If you get money in the summer, would you take him? Of 100%. course. I did a documentary about this, a 15-minute, uh, what's wrong with Rashford this season. I don't know if you've seen it, right? No. I go over the Bel- Belfast incident and the player power and everything. You know, the only one that has the answer that can help himself is Rashford, right? There is a good player in there, but I think that he's checked out already. He doesn't believe, right? Maybe he needs a fresh start, right? I'm, I don't care about players. I care about the club and the way we're moving forward. But if you are hindering and putting a how do I say, bad persona or bad um, example as a senior player to youngsters, evidently you've seen that they are starting to act the same. Like, hang on, if you can do that, get away with murder, go party, take tequila shots, come come to never rock up for training, and I get slapped on the wrist and get banned for one game for liking a tweet. Where's levels? Where's the double-edged standards? So this has to stop, right? So if we do get money... It's a homegrown talent, pure profit, 75 million. PSG comes in. Will you take it? I'd take 50. You take 50. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he's a I don't think he's no. a no agenda though. No agenda, but seriously from a football. No, it's not an agenda. We're just stating facts. What our eyes are seeing. We're not going personal like some channels this week have gone. We're just stating facts on what we are seeing as fans and what no, I mean, is not being addressed. I mean, I did, I did a documentary about it, and I instantly got a tweet and protect. I, I didn't go in on Rashford. Like you, know, you, you got to watch the documentary. I covered everything because I'm as a journalist, as an independent journalist, this is what I, that's my duty to look at both sides of the stories. And at the end of the day, how you interpret it, it's it's your mind, right? 
I'm just telling you the story. But as a storyteller, I have to look at everything, right? It's not one-sided where you just point the finger. This is the problem. There's multitudes of problems. And the most majority of the problem is comes down to the individual, always. In any work situation, you as a manager can shout and scream to do blue in the face, do this, do that, motivate, talk to the, uh, to the player that has, or your staff member that has problems. But the only way they can get themselves out of trouble, like Arnold Palmer said, if you get yourself in trouble, you're the only one that can get yourself out of trouble, right? And it comes down to here, your brain. So arguably to say that you got your contract, you bump up your contract, you're getting 300 something pounds a week, right? Boom, boom, ching, ching, vida, vida loca. You're not going to put a shift in. Before you They're did drop the socks off. Yeah, but drop him. But somebody at the club is protecting me as well over the manager. Somebody at the club saying, this is our asset. This is a poster boy. This is a PR tool. You got to play him. Either is something written in his contract with him, Maguire, with him and Scott McTominay, that you have to play them because that's why you can that's why you see them playing week in and week out. Managers do have a lot of power, right? Managers do go and speak to the club and keep contact with the club. Why are you not picking? It's part of this contract. It's written in his clause. He needs to play minimum 38 games a week. That's written in his clause. You know what I mean? Otherwise, they're facing pe penalties. At the end of the day, Mick, it's, 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 it's a shit it's show. It's a number. Yeah, it is. It yeah. is. It is a shit Look. show. You just hope, what, we've got four weeks left. You hope they can get into some sort of form. We've got Coventry. And I think we've got Sheffield United, Burnley at yeah, home. Yeah. Look, and guys, then, um, Coventry, are you confident, Wembley, with the current squad? Or would you just would you just throw in I mean, currently, let's face it, the under 18s is better than the first team. When your under 18s is lead in the league and have a gold mine of talent, why don't you just pick in the under 18s, some of them and play the FA Cup semi final? What do you have to lose? They, or the they, they, they let, look. His team selection will tell you everything on Sunday. Casemiro's going to play. Rashford's going to play. Mount's going to be on the bench. Um, he's going to play Kobe Menu. In my opinion, Kobe Menu should be pulled out of the team just to give him a rest. He's really young. It's too many games for him. Just slowly ease him in. There are other yeah. midfielders that could play in there. Um, but just, let's see. Just, just to touch a final point, what Jolly Malmin is saying, based on this documentary, my find, he says, well, like Rashford, new contract was signed by Eric Ten Hag and Arnold. But however, it would, how would a manager agree to always having to play the player goes beyond the understanding? It's not Ten Hag that signed, he vetoed probably. But the, the thing is, the explanatory when... When he came back from the Belfast incident, he, he rocked up with his uh, with Dwayne Winard, which is his manager, and his brother and Taraj, and they had a meeting with Ten Hag and Murta, right? So it's probably Murta and his brother-in-law who does all the legal stuff because Murta outsourced everything that he did at United. He was good at the academy stuff, but as a sporting director, it was shambolic. We all know it, right? So instantly they came in to say, and probably as what you do as your legal representative. This is part of your contract. You cannot drop me. What did Ten Hag do? He got strong-armed. He got strong-armed. It's evidential there, like, you know, because he was back into, with the, say, with the fine two weeks' wages, and he was back into the game against Wolves when he scored. And that was the first goal Kobe Maino scored, the 4-3 goal. Remember that one? Yeah. So it's evidential that you've been strong armed either by the Glazers or the, the agent as well. They say, Well, hang on, here's the contract. If you don't do that, you will impose a fine on the club. And unfortunately, agents do have a lot of they you have a lot of powerful agents that in certain you know these clauses in the Well, contract. the killing if, if, if that's the case, Mick, his agents are They're killing the manager, yeah, hundred percent. His brother's out of form, he's getting slated every week and his value's plummeting. Yeah. So it's but not that, very that, is, good that is unfortunately a, a reality what also Ten Hag is undergoing, right? Because you're powerless against that. Your contract, what's written in the clause, overrules whatever you say. And that might be the reason why you see he's forced to pick certain players, right? 
so and not a lot of people speak about that but you know i don't know if it's in it but i know that it exists so and i'm sure it, it exists 100 you are like you know 300 pound player a week i'm sure you have something written in that contract anyway done with that bilal if unless you have guys if you have any questions please come in right now we can do the q a section but i want to transition to the latest okay enough of talking about that we covered the future how it looks like and potential new managers were available in 2025 the best in class but we also talk about the complete overhaul, who else is going to go and when the new establishment will start. Uh, what else did we cover? We got to talk, to talk about also the recruitment in the summer. What I said about the outs will be the, the biggest issue here in the summer to get rid. That's going to be the biggest task. But if you were Ten Hag or if you were the new sporting establishment, which position would you address first and why? I think I would address the midfield. Um, I think that's the biggest problem. So I would look at adding in. I would look at removing Ericsson, um, McTominay, Casemiro, and I would looking at replacing all three of them with a better profile of player who can adapt in between. Caicedo is a good example of this, who can play two, three positions. That type of player who can play six, eight, and, and really fit a profile of, you know, strength. Onana or Everton is really good, but there's Fofana as well. Um, there's a couple of others out there who are really, really, really good. Yeah. Um, but that's what I would look at. I would look at definitely the central uh, defensive midfield, uh, as mentioned, right? I was looking at, we need more than, I don't know, Onana, what you mentioned just now from Everton, right? We, we, just, we just need two more competition for the places because let's say i don't think they're going to keep casemiro but it's going to be tough task to out he's got two years left on his contract though so it's going to be a tough one but if his leg is going if there's a bit coming in from saudi i would definitely get rid of him to be honest because we are on the generational makeshift building a new team and although he was my man of the match last season it's just abomination to see his downfall like what we saw with Cristiano Ronaldo coming back to United the mind is there but the body is not following and uh, yeah, we, need, we, we can't we can't be on the sentiment like we got to be ruthless as fans as well to say well if we are going to do a rebuild look, just do a clean slate just focus on the players that needs that deserves to be here that is worth developing and just bring in players that will fit the system right the f they will fit recruiting but Athleticism, make, smartness, if sharpness, the case, technical then, ball plays. Then I will go uh, central defender, midfielder, definitely two centre backs, and watch out for Benjamin Sesko. Like I always been saying for the past seven, eight months. Now Ben Jacobs coming out to say Ben uh, Sesko, and I say, well, Sesko is the number one target in striker target for Manchester United. It's been so for the past eighteen months, and keep your eyes on that one, Xerxes what we've been linked to, is most likely going to Aston Villa because they are willing to pay the, the, the clause of 60 to 70 million euro. I don't think we'll pay 60 to 70 million or 75 for Xerxes. We are looking for somebody that we can develop, that can challenge Hoyland, but it's equal quality. And that is Benjamin Sesko, our dear friend. So keep your eye on that one. You heard it here as well. And I would also keep an eye on Ross Barkley. And Ross Barkley. Um, and He's even even transfer. um yeah yeah, good yeah. Job as well. it's a free transfer so you might look at Ross Barkley as a free transfer as well but you might, might we also been linked to Fring Pong and uh, as a right winger but he, he he's not even a right back he's a right winger he plays in a, he's a right five. winger like I'm saying that he's not a right back he's he's good bombing forward now United need, needs a left back left back and hence what you're seeing the introduction of Harry Amas watch out for Harry Amas by the way. But Harry Amas is not enough because it's uncertainty regarding Malasia. If it's a career ending. Well, Malasia, just can I just shed some light on this? Mal well, what happened to Malasia was which was, which, which it was big, big um, ig oversight by the club. So they've let him how, go to Holland, have his own operation with the doctor of his own choice. Yeah. Um, it's a standard cartilage operation. And um, he's come back, started training, and the cartilage is still there. Yeah. Whilst he had the first operation, nobody from the club was dealing 
or liaising with the doctor yeah, and then they've got then they've let him have a second operation with the same doctor again yeah and that was happened with him um, well, you had Dr. Death in the club, to be honest, from Arsenal. So. Uh, no, he's not that. I wouldn't believe Arsenal fans fucking with No, him. but our he's medical a, department, you know, everyone knows about our medical department. It's an internal issue, 100%. You know, it goes back to, you know, Casemiro as well, feeling a niggle in his hamstring, going to a medical department. They, they do a, a scan or whatever they do. And they said, are oh, you clear to play? Nothing. Okay. He still, but I still feel something. So he went to his old camp in Barcelona, his old doctor, and they said they found something. You know what I mean? Listen, regarding that, and Luke Shaw, by the way, I, I, to Jesus, I mean, well, we talk. Can't about, play Luke Shaw. You can't anymore. You can't trust him uh, anymore. I love Luke Shaw when he's fit, you know. But I think this his days are over, right? Same with Anthony Martial. You know when it's. You know when you're having a party uh, and you 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 rock up to a friend's party house, you know when it's time to leave. But you have certain guests that never want to leave. They want to sit there until you fall asleep on your own couch, right? And you have to kick them out. And I feel that there is, this is the case, right? So we know that Martial is leaving, Eriksson is leaving. What's the point? Christian Eriksson is not even getting minutes. He's like questioning what the hell, right? You have problems in the midfield and you're not even using me. So for me... It's a total overhaul of like, you know, getting Lindelof out of the club. I'm sorry, Varane probably will not get a new contract. I think he will be going out because they're looking at he's two other free anyway. Yeah, he's a free anyway. So he will probably go on a free agent. It will be difficult to get rid of Harry Maguire. And I think they will keep Harry Maguire uh, as a fourth choice centre back. Depends on what Harry Maguire wants to do, though. And uh, you probably get a, you know, you already have Kwambala, um, which by standards when we recruited him, he was the top choice of young up-and-coming centre-backs in Europe at the moment, right? So we got the best in class ready to be embedded. But this Tony Bow, like, you know, this Braithwaite, what, what's his name, Braithwaite? I, I don't rate Braithwaite yeah, that yeah, much. Yeah, the one from Everton. He got nutmegged yeah. yesterday. Yeah, he did, again. <laughs> but you might you might see, like, a, a Gleason Bremer, like, you know, a more experienced 26-year-old because you, you can't just play youth. You need experience as well. So if Casemiro goes, you might have a Brentwood coming in instead, you know. And there's also, what what would I say? Like, you know, striker, I cover Benjamin Sesco, but we need two to three midfielders, 100%, like, you know, in order to play. Wingers, I think we're good, but we have a problem with Donny van der Beek, apparently, as well, because Antrak Frankfurt, do not want him, right? Benfica reportedly said we will not probably, re, you know, trigger the release clause for, you know, Alvaro Fernandez. So there's your left back as well, right? If he's not good enough for Benfica, he's not good enough for us, then is he, mate? Oh, no, they might do these tactics to say, look, look, they're starting to play him. He's done well now. But, you know, remember that Benfica is kind of a feeders club, right? They do this, what we should have been doing. Like, you know, just go in by talent from the grassroots leagues and buy them for the cheap and then sell them for 100 million this is what benfica does this is what the rb thing, like yeah but what i'm I trying to say look. they might say so to say well if we're going to use him right all of a sudden united is going to increase the price so we gonna, gonna, we see what he's all about we start to introduce him at the end of the season and we might get away to pay pay that eight million right you see the tactics we're talking about <laughs> benfica here they're not mugs, right? And th exactly what Dortmund is doing as well. Yeah, you know, um, absolutely. The thing about the Portuguese clubs is, I had a look at this, is the reason they attract the talent as well is they allowed third-party ownerships, hence why they get the best talent yeah. from South America and everywhere. But yeah, yeah they, could, they could all be fucking us around. But yeah. we've got that many players, fringe players, that are on loan, not doing well. Yeah, and then it's, it's a, yeah, true. Job. It's, it's a big, it's a big, big, big job. job. And people, don't forget, the biggest problem that the current establishment having right now is the outs. You know, remember this. And big up people in the chat. Danny B, we need two centre-backs, three, uh, two to three centre-backs, left-back, three mids, and a striker. Totally okay, a new agree. team then. <laughs> Do a Todd Bowley there. Totally new team. Team, just splash the cash. Before we close the shop, uh, Everton didn't look too good yesterday. Wow. Cong oh, yes, when yes. Have Everton, when have Everton Listen. looked good? Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, you know what? 
the under 18s won the league. And that's why I say it is funny when you have your under 18s playing better football and winning the league than your first team. That's what I said. I forgot. Congratulations to under 18s for winning the league. Big up. Um, let's see. Before we close the shop, what are we having here? Players lose your games, not tactics. There's so much crap talked about tactics by people who barely know how to win at dom and at dominoes. Brian Cloth. That's a good statement. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Brian Cloth said that. Yeah, he did. Big up, Alexander. Uh, I see a lot of legends in the house, Ellie and Tenno. Your first choice is to sell Rashford, get Greenwood back. And there's another conundrum that the club has to deal with. You know, you got to come out and just make it clear. Like, what is your fucking plan at the moment right, with Greenwood? Either you sell him or you keep him. You can't dilly-dally, right? There's numerous report, and it's going to be like, you know, PR nightmare for them if they bring them back as well. But I look at it from a football perspective, Bilal. I look at what this team need right here, right? Where is the problem? We have a player there that you can't unseen what you've seen. But if you've gone down through all this investigation and you find him not guilty, club has done the due diligence, find him not guilty, you introduced it to Ten Hag to say you will have Mason back. And somebody from the club didn't like it and leaked it out and got Richard Arnold sacked. So you understand the whole gravity of the whole thing. But if you currently have one player that is ripping up trees, right, and he's currently one of ours, underpaid contract, wouldn't you say, wait, wait a minute, why are we going out to recruit somebody when we already have somebody on the books? Don't you think that Ineos are looking at it more, what Ratcliffe was saying there, that we are looking more at the character than what he actually, you know, done outside? He said something in those lines, right? We will assess it. He did, he did, he did say that. And I think with Ineos, obviously, they'll have their way of working and how to kind of imply what they want to do. The thing is, one one of my biggest concerns is, is fans not being patient. You're seeing that already, you know, um, patience is going to be key. Um, and just on a side note, mate, just to add to that, I was just looking then, United have released pictures of the task force for the Old Trafford regeneration. And they're all oh. having a meeting with Seb Co. And he's released oh. a statement, which I'll read out for you. He's saying this meeting yeah. marked the start of a multi-stakeholder process to explore options for the stadium and surrounding area. We are at the start of this journey and it is too soon to know where it will lead. But we will consult closely with fans, local residents along the way and keep everyone informed of progress. So, so they've started on this. There's pictures of them in a meeting and starting to look yeah. at this. Yeah, but it's so far... Just PR, like, and it's a meeting, right? Nobody really knows. I mean, the priority first, Bilal, everyone can agree, you need to fix this team first, right? You need to fix the structure before you even talk about a new stadium. We know that this stadium is the I cherry. Think, I think you need to mix. fix it. Wait, no, no, wait, wait, let me finish. You need to fix the training ground. The training ground is great. The facilities needs to be upgraded. The medical department needs to be upgraded. The, the instruments needs to be up, upgraded. The gym, everything first, because of what? players do they train more than they're playing games right before you even think about a stadium and who's going to fund this stadium we spoke about this as well debt to equity or sponsorship xyz what jean claude jean claude blanc did with juventus same guy is part of the inia structure right yeah i think i think you're 100 correct the team needs addressing they are trying to address this mm -hmm. by bringing working top down so having the best execs in place to make the right decisions rather than jim radcliffe coming in doing a todd bowley and sucking the manager then bringing somebody else in and then the director of football comes in and says i don't want this manager yeah no so bilan bilan i'm gonna ask you we were running out of press for time listen so far it's been a lot of pr i, I just go back to the dan ashwood story that so Jim Ratcliffe goes in and saves the day by having lunch or discussions with the co-owner of Newcastle. I mean, come on, man. And and today it came out that Sir Jim Ratcliffe comes out to save the day to stop the media links and social media conduct. Did, did, you, did you read that story? So you know how yeah. the PR machine works. But, you know, you got to be careful, right? Because this is what I'm saying. Be careful because the majority who owns this is still the Glazer family, right? 
don't forget what they've done to us. And what you see now is a diversion in a way that they are taking a backseat, taking, you know, there's no more pointing fingers at the Glazers because right now the only one that people are pointing fingers at is Sir Jim Ratcliffe. You don't read about the Glazers, you know, Ratcliffe, Ratcliffe, it's all this PR, right? So don't be delusional, just focus on the key task. And that's what we're saying, keep saying. The proof will be in the pudding until it's eating. We keep saying that, right? And right now, nothing is in place. So therefore, you got to be critical with an open mind, with not fuss. Do you agree? I agree 100%. I've always said this, the proof will be in the pudding, right? Always. And I think we're starting to see some signs because the type of execs yeah. they are trying to sign are not, they're already in jobs. It's not like they've gone and looked who's on the open market, bring them in. Yep. They are looking at bringing in good people who better than what we've had, who can kind of implement and work on this structure. They're trying. Obviously, time is tight. I was looking at Liverpool just to kind of compare it. And even their new director of football is still working at uh, Bournemouth right now. Um, yeah. So so everyone's in that kind of boat. I think fans need to be patient. But what is not helping the overall thing is it's Mr. Eric Ten Hag and his... Hmm. Um, Fun impatiency and, and Ten Hag's selection is causing us more stress than ever. Right. It's fair to say that if you marry everything together, you understand the recruitment policy, what's going to be in the summer, meaning we are going for younger players across the grassroots leagues in South America. Scouting system is going to be there. You are now all of a sudden seeing evidence that in order to be successful, we are appointing the best in class people, the directors on top and building all the way from to the bottom that we are building a new United, meaning a new squad as well. I, I keep saying it ever since the January window that we are on a generational makeshift. That means that in order to do so, you need to drain out everything that's clogged in that sink in order to have the water free flowing through the pipes. And that means that the recruitment strategy is to introduce the young academy that's been developed over four or five years successfully, the under-18s that just won the league, introduce some of those players that will save you a lot of money, and then you add on another four players to the team, right? So did you see what I'm trying to say here? You might not be able to go out and spend seven on seven players because you know already what's, what's flowing underneath the surface, and this is the golden generation youth. So you got to be patient to understand it's not a switch of a light bulb, like, you know, a light switch that things will happen over one night. So if Ten Hag will be in this job or not, it's not for us to decide. At the end of the day, we see what we see. I'm not personally the one that will scream in or out or shout, but the reason why I'm here is because I consider myself being a voice of reason, right? To keep a balanced approach. So Bilal, at the end of the day, after... Everything that's been said and done, you know, do you see a path moving forward with what we discussed today, right? Right now, like, you know, with this recruitment yeah, policy, with what Ineos envision and with the rebuild and how you, how, how a rebuild, proper rebuild work. I mean, if you work in HR and stuff like that, you will understand, you know, people makes the change, not the leaders, right? So it will take like, you know, Leaders come in with a vision, and then you have people that will execute it and follow. And we haven't had that at United. No, we haven't had that. And look, like I just said, <laughs> they are working top down, number one. So execs will make the decisions. Um, they haven't come in and started saying we're signing. You haven't heard anywhere that they're signing Mbappe or you know Vinicius Juniors on the no, transfer. They're not going to sign Mbappe. You know because they are working. They're going to make Mbappe. They're going to make Mbappe. They are working top down. Fans mm -hmm. need to be patient, and I'm sure they'll get it right. It can't mm. go any worse than what it's already gone. Yep. Our dear colleague, our co-host, Mr. Jarvis Cockers, who had a brilliant uh, Jarvis Cockers corner yesterday. If you missed it, go, wa go watch it, right? It was amazing, as per usual, 90 minutes of pure nerdfest football, Jarvis Cocker. Go check it out. It was yesterday. Jarvis is saying 100%. When Jarvis speaks, he speaks a lot of tactics and football. I, ca I can listen to him for hours and hours. makes sense. He says 100% a striker first, then a ball-playing left-footed centre-back. I agree. Left back, midfield, and another centre back if funds are available. True. It's a but big that, window. It's a big window. 
But then Jarvis is what we're saying before also. You also got to look at what academy players could be available as well. But you need competition for each places. And we might do a show about this 100%. Like, you know, if you decide to keep, let's say, Amrabat, then who's going to play? You need two, three players more next to Amrabat. You know what I mean? We don't have that, right? So if you going to stick with Maino, Maino is still young. You can't run him to the ground, right? He's 20 years old. Not even that. 18. How, how old is Maino now? 18. 18, yeah, 18 years. Weeks, yeah, who was 20 now? Yeah, yeah, true, true. So you got to have at least another one more experienced next to him or and then add another youth player to it, like, you know, a Dangor or Fletcher, you know, Jack Fletcher or something like that. Which is uh, mm. apparently like you know six feet, foot tall, like monster in the CDM, which the club is looking to bring but in make, as well. Can I just add into something? Fans shouldn't be uh, show disrespect either if United bring in short term gaps like uh, Ross Barkley either. You know, players that are runner free who can do a job for a season or two because we're not going to be able to sign eight, nine, ten players in two windows. You yeah. know. And the average strike rate, a success rate of a transfer is 50% if yeah. you're really good at what you do. True. Um, Manchester 7, big up for you that picked it up as well. Like, you know, media seems to have misreported on Xerxes' release clause was originally said to be 40 million. It's not. Bologna, I think they said it's 60 to 70 million. And this is what his agent, she, super agent, she's, it's a she, is currently negotiating with Aston Villa. And I think that Aston Villa will land him because I don't think we will pay that kind of money for a secondary striker. And that's why I said keep an eye on Benjamin Sesko that uh, RB Leipzig has said, like, even if his release clause is on 40 million pounds or 40 million euros, 40 million euros, they are willing to work a structure on that deal. So it's not that you have to pay 40 million up front. They're willing to work because why? They're a feeder club, right? So they want their place to be successful. So they are in deep negotiations. So keep your eyes on that one. And I agree with what you're saying there. Uh, sorry, you were saying it's yeah, such a I big show today, man. Big up to all of you. Yeah, uh, I was saying that basically fans should be open to players that could come in and do a job for a short time. You know, but Ross Barkley, whether that's Danny Welbeck, you know. Danny Welbeck is for free as well, yeah, 100%. Yeah, so because... We need so many players. We're not going to be able to sign 60, 70 million pound, eight players valued at that money. You know so what it is? It's, it's, it's a fringe baby. player. It's, it's called squad depth, right? Even if they're for free and they are in a decent age, they are not like, you know, yeah. a 33-year-old. Um, Juventus. You, when Juventus got promoted once they've been relegated for match fixing, their whole team was built on free transfers. Patrice Evera, Tevez... Mm -hmm. So many players that they just built a whole... They went 3 4 so just doing free transfers. And I think we should be open to the idea of just not glamorous names like Paul Pogba, but Ross Barkley, these type of players. They can add a lot of value to what we do. Yeah. No, perfectly fine. All right, so Bilal, one more point that I want to sort of discuss. And it's a burning issue regarding the FFP the new rules that transition us from the PSR, meaning we clubs can now spend 85% of the total football generations from 75% to 85%. There was also introduced some beauty tax instead of points deduction, meaning that you, you can pay yourself out. Isn't that corrupt? But that leads into Manchester City. Manchester City, I'm sorry, everyone kind of allegedly know, even the director of UEFA was saying that I know you cheated. You did that on purpose in the arbitration in Switzerland. What did you call that? Sports arbitration in Switzerland when you time-stamped and time-barred and over-appealed. But here, with this independent investigation, you cannot overturn. It is what it is. So now, Bilal, as per my understanding, they have set a trial date to start in fall, and that is expected to take one year to verdict what is your take why is it one year i had a look at this actually um i was, I was doing it for my own uh, show basically is the reason nottingham forest and everton have been uh, charged or whatever you want to call it beforehand is because there are only one or two charges 
they've been charged with yes, because yes. city have 115 it's mm. a lot of work it's yeah, a lot it of is. work and it's complex it's a lot of work hence why um it's taken so long um oh. in my opinion some of them will stick some of them won't um now what it'll come down to is what the premier league they've set the benchmark already you've seen what they've done with yeah um uh, Everton and Forest. You've seen it happen to Leicester as well, who are already deducted points. I think from next season, they'll start on a minus. So whether they, whether this concept of they get put into the second tier of English football, they get their trophies taken off them. I don't know, um, but it's going to be scrutinised, and they'll set their benchmark for what happens next. And I also well, think Chelsea will get dragged into this as well. Yes, and but there's a point there what you're saying there, and and it's been investigated very thoroughly, and and you've seen the result what Everton and and Nottingham Forest and all the minor clubs has been getting points deduction, and apparently Everton is going to get more points deduction as well apparently, but certainly you know why it's going to take a year. This is my take on it because it's 115 charges as what you say, and they want to make it stick. They have a bulletproof case, and they're not mugs either. Like you know, Sheikh Mansour, you know, he's he's elite. He's elite. You cannot deny. He's on the top of the pyramid, and he's got people. He's got lawyers, right? Lawyered up, and they're going to fight this to their tooth and nail. But you cannot dodge 115 bullets, right? Yeah, they... 115 counts. Is and 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 the <laughs> prosecution in certain ways want to make sure that this doesn't slip out to the fingers, and they want to be able to nail them on something. And I, I anybody... think if, if I and I think just just to finish run up my point, I think if you see an Everton getting points deduction, ten points deduction for a few allegations, right? And, and and Nottingham Forest, and you can imagine the repercussion of having this hundred and fifteen. I would say minimum I know just forget about banning two years in sporting. This is actually talking about winning a potential four P on cheating, all right? Four P's in yeah. cheating, strip off all that, and also do a relegation and put the owner to see in front of it to say, are you willing to still keep the club or are you going to run it as a proper footballing club? Because if, there's no if, way that you have more revenues and it being such a small club size than Real Madrid. It's not the revenue. It, it's where they were paying managers. They were paying them <laughs> half. <laughs> through separate companies that they owned and yeah, but half the financial no, 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 but, you know, wait, wait, wait. It, it, the financial statement they released Bilal showed that they earned more than Real Madrid and everyone else and it's like excuse me <laughs> they call it but fair it, market value don't they yeah it's like it's been dodgy deals like they have cousins inflating money dodgy sponsorship deals it's all there there's emails there's oh, so much things so at the end of the and day, the accounts as well to the as evidence they were not as providing. A, I want to hear from you, panel, as well, and from you, Bilal. I want to hear from people in the VR. If you're watching this in retrospect, you leave your comments because we like to read what you think. But as from a football lover, from a sporting lover, I like fair play. You know, if somebody's doping and cheating, of course you're going to take off the medals in any Olympic like they did against Ben Johnson, like they did like, you know, Lance Armstrong when they find him guilty in doping and cycling, right? It's unfair because what they've done is building up a squad on cheating. It's not the manager's fault. It's not the team. It's not the player's fault. But at the end of the day, it comes down to who's actually paying you guys, right? Who is actually in charge? So if they do strip them, like you know, from all the titles and all the you know relegate them to two divisions or whatever that might be, I'm fine for that, and I, I think that's justice. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I think look, it's it's if this was a crime drama, if anybody watches crime drama, <laughs> normally what would happen at this point is the prosecution and the defense would do a deal just to save on the amount of money that is going to cost to take this. And oh my um, God. I think they should just try settling this. Maybe say, Settle. all right, we did 60 of them. But why, um, you know, why are you dragging this out if you know you're guilty? You're just trying to kick. The, you know you're guilty. And that's the thing. Just do what Klopp did. Just come out to say, I'm burned out. I'm guilty. Like Everton did. They cooperated, put up their hand to say, 
yes, we're willing to cooperate. And even if they cooperated, they got punished. That's the thing. But if they are deliberately, you know, just avoiding, I mean, there's got to be something in it. There's some shit stinking in the corner, right? Yo, you know, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, it's yeah. There's obviously it. something. There's something there. We'll have to see what happens, Mick. We'll have, we to, have see. to see. Listen, beautiful people. That is it. That is about wrapping up the show. We had beautiful Bilal Yogi and myself, and I got interviewed on my own show, which is wow. <laughs> Big up, Bilal. Um, just a uh, quick, quick, guys. If what we talked about in the beginning of the show, you can see spot this article up here as well. Go into mefcrealist.tv go to the articles actually that's actually wrong that is actually your chat sorry for displaying that I close down the chat and do it again wait a minute this is what you get when you don't have a producer in the room mate eh? <laughs> this is the one people go read this article it's there uh, on the website mefcrealist.tv and have a read and let me know what you think. Like, you know, we discussed is Ten Hag potentially playing for his own sack, you know. Um, and can you guys hear me still? Yeah. Right. So go check that article out, really. This has been a fun podcast for the day. This is the only stream we do. Um, I don't think there's too much to report uh, other than that just keep your heads cool and composed don't believe anything what the headlines are saying regarding managers in you know at the end of the day your mental health plays a major important life in your social life as well it's a game of football and that's what it is uh, it's been mick ruby here joined by the lovely amazing bilal yogi who lost all his hair for being a manchester united supporter but please do us a favor go check out his channel bilal what is your channel name and guys check me out full-time reds Follow me on Twitter. I am Bilal Jogi. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. See you guys soon. Yep. Thank you, Bilal. And please like and subscribe. It's free. Glory, glory, Manchester United. And keep, remind yourself, glazes out. Peace. <laughs> Let's go. Thank you so much for stopping by and watching MEFC Realist TV. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow us on the socials.